Right. Here we go, letting everybody in. Okay. Woo. Great. Wow, here we go. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Where are you all from? Where is everybody from? Please feel free to write in the chat box. I'm here with, with Scott Thornbury. Here he is. Where, where are you at the moment, Scott? I'm in uh, a small town just north of Barcelona in Spain, small town on the coast where it's baking hot and humid and it's about to rain. And it's about to rain, okay. So how, how are things over there with the dreaded, with the, the, the C word, the, the, oh, the coronavirus? Well, right I mean, you know, Spain was, as you well know, was struck pretty hard. We had a very severe lockdown from which we have emerged. Um, it, for me personally, uh, I mean, there was pluses and minuses. Uh, since most of my work is on, I work from home predominantly and I teach online and do all that, I have been for years. It didn't mm. affect me profes pro professionally, except that I lost my job. Um, the, university, <laughs> yes, the university I work for in Manhattan uh, was hit very badly by the downturn in student numbers because 40% of their population, student population comes from overseas. And mm. so they had to kind of, they had a kind of, what I imagine was a, a balloon debate where they decided who, who can we toss out of a balloon? Yeah. And my name being non-resident and not even American, I was one of the first to be tossed out. So oh, no. uh, I've been forced into kind of early retirement, but that's okay. <laughs> That's fine, no problem. Well, look, I'm just going to share the screen with everybody for a second to say welcome, Scott, and welcome everybody to We're All In This Together, our interview live with Scott Thornbury today, and to say thank you very, very much to International House in Montevideo for sponsoring us and providing the Zoom platform. And any of you who were here over the last couple of sessions, you will know that International House are starting a literary acquisition, the teaching and learning course. In fact, it starts tomorrow, Monday, the 3rd of August, and um, you can get a 15% discount for mentioning we're all in this together. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen now. I just want to say to everybody as well, there we go, that um, it's a real shame that uh, Florencia can't be here with us today, like she always is. Unfortunately, she had surgery this week and she's still recovering from it. So um, she wanted everyone to know how sorry she was that she couldn't be here. She really, really wanted to be here with Scott and with, um, with everybody else, but, uh, but she's doing all right. She's doing all right, but she's still recovering. So we'll look. Scott, let's let's start off, shall we, by um, talking about the the D word, shall we? Because um, and that that D word being dogma. I see the the wry smile on your face um, <laughs> before I before I even ask the question. Because the situation is, you've written about seventeen books and countless articles, and you're the series editor for Cambridge Handbooks for Teachers, but you're arguably still most famous for being the father, as it were, of Dogme ELT. Um, is, is that a good feeling or does it, does it get annoying sometimes? Well, it's, it's nice to be the father of something, I guess. Um, I, it, no, it doesn't get annoying. I mean, uh, it, it's intriguing uh, how what started life as a kind of uh, a dashed off article I wrote in 2000, uh, literally two pages long for the Ayatefu newsletter, yes. kind of propagated this monster, which I've had to live with ever since. And uh, such that uh, it's true, I do get identified with dogma and um, with uh, Teaching Unplugged, as we tried to kind of rebrand it. Um, let, those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, uh, let, just let me uh, fill you in on the background. In 2000, I wrote that article where I expressed what I thought was a kind of a concern 
that we were over-resourced in the profession and we were losing sight of some of the core pedagogical values, particularly those associated with the communicative approach. It was the communicative approach that I, in a sense, grew up with. And I was, I've always subscribed to its basic beliefs that you learn a language principally through communication or that communication at least should be in the, uh, the main activity in the classroom. But I saw communication getting squeezed uh, by the pressure of not just technology, which in the year 2000, which is actually relatively light, uh, but by the influence of the course book and everything that the course book kind of uh, encapsulates, particularly the grammar syllabus mm. and the, the, the methodology that you learn a language by learning one grammar McNugget at a time. It's kind of incremental, linear, mechanistic process in which the learner has no say in terms of you know what they want to talk about uh it's all prescripted and so i use the analogy of the danish dogma 95 film movement which tried to um what they called mount a, a rescue operation for filmmaking to rescue filmmaking from the clutches of big budget, high tech Hollywood movies and to create movies which were locally produced without special effects, local stories, amateur actors, etc. And I saw an analogy there between what I wanted to mount, which was a rescue action for uh, English language teaching or language teaching generally. And so I wrote that article saying, do we need a similar kind of movement in English language teaching. And it was like a spark uh, that ignited a forest fire. Although I have to say, it took a while to kind of get burning. But uh, when that article went out in March 2000, I immediately started getting people contacting me saying, oh, that's amazing. That's exactly what we've been trying to do in our school in London. Or a teacher in Poland said, no, we, this is what we want to do uh here is what i've been doing you know and somebody in romania and so it went on and so we started a, a discussion group online uh which is something that you could only just do in those days uh and we that lasted for well uh, 10 years at least generating a huge amount of discussion debate argument counter argument and so on and out of that emerged the actually can i be shameless and uh <laughs> you can a, a copy if i can see it uh anyway the book oh oh here it is um teaching unplugged which i co-wrote with um luke meddings who's mm -hmm. one of the original uh subscribers to the group and that kind of in a sense pulled together all these all this discussion that had been going on for all these years and kind of tried to reduce dogma or try to reposition dogma not as being anti course book or anti technology or anti anything but pro communication pro the learner yeah uh and so we boiled down the basic principles of dogma stroke teaching unplugged to three which was um Language learning. I'll tell you if you don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to look them up. <laughs> language. What's the first one? Emerging language. That is conversation driven, mm. materials light, and which focuses on emergent language. That is the language that emerges in the classroom out of the conversations or the texts created by the learners. So it's not a pre selected syllabus of items and today is tuesday we're going to do the present perfect continuous even though we've done it before or even though you may not be ready for it or even though you may never use it we're going to do it because it's in the book it's in the syllabus and it's in the exam so this was a kind of what we were trying to do this counter movement so so that was the history now 20 years on thinking wow i mean um interestingly enough actually uh, i'm working with a group of teachers at the moment in jordan these are refugees, the teachers from Syria and 
Sudan and Somalia, among other countries, they have been having dogma lessons themselves uh, in Jordan, and now they're going. They're teaching their fellow refugees using these same techniques, but mm. online because right. of the, the big change. So that what's happened? And I we're tra- so I have a session on Tuesday, a training session on Zoom with these teachers where we talk about the experience, how it's been going. I can watch some of their lessons, which are recorded uh, and Zoom. And, um, and then we give, I give feedback and we talk about various techniques that we could be using, et cetera. So this is what's happening now in 2020. Refugees in lockdown are using dogma or teaching unplugged mm. principles and practices to teach other refugees. So I think, well, you know, if I'm the father of anything, I'm pr- <laughs> proud to be the father of that. <laughs> Great. Well, in fact, uh, I don't know whether this was what you were just mentioning a second ago, but in one of our email exchanges, you mentioned a course that you're doing um, in, in dogmatic teaching at the moment. Ah, well, yes. So that coincidentally, um, I have been... You know, <laughs> I mean, coming back to your original question, I did try to sort of lay the ghost of dogma. And sort of, I want to say, no, no, it's not the only thing I've ever done or I want to be known for, but it just keeps coming back. It's like, you know, bamboo. You cut it down and it springs back up again. Uh, and so two years ago, I was asked to do a course uh, in Russia, an intensive weekend course on dog teaching dogma, which I did. And that actually was extraordinarily pleasurable. And these were a fantastic group of teachers who knew more about dogma than I did, actually, many of them. Uh, and then I did the same thing uh, in a similar kind of course in Ukraine. And then I was due to go back in April to Belarus uh, and do the same course in Minsk. Uh, but of course, that was cancelled. So, so I've resurrected the course and I'm going to do it online now for the ITDI. Mm. The National Teacher Development Institute, uh, mm. and Vicky has kindly. Hi, Vicky. Hi, Vicky. I'm going to mention you in a second, Vicky. Has kindly posted the link, yes. uh, and that's running in September over four weeks. So it'll be an online course in the principles and practice of dogma stroke teaching unplugged. Right. And Carolina and... has already signed up. Bless you, Carolina. I'll see you in September. Oh, great. Which Carolina is that? Do you... By the way, you don't know her surname, do you? Vaskovic. Vaskovic. Okay, great, great. Okay, um, no, I was going to mention that, and especially now that Vicky's just written in the chat box, because my involvement uh, with you, Scott, was when I was doing my Delta experimental practice about ten years ago, and I, I wrote you an email um, asking a bit more about dogma and whether you thought it was possible to have a school or you know teach a course on a on a long-term basis and you said actually there's a woman called Vicky Salmel in Buenos Aires in in Nunez <laughs> who's already doing it and then I got in touch with her and I went to observe a couple of her of her classes so um thank you for that as well Scott I've got a lot to thank you for <laughs> that's amazing that's amazing and that was the strength of that uh, discussion group that as I say went for 10 years it gathered together some fantastic minds uh and it disseminated the the kind of basic principles of dogma so that they could emerge which is a dogma principle locally adapted to the local context and that's what vicky obviously did and and, uh, i'm ever so grateful yeah no it's 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 fantastic so um you know, talking talking about that, because it's been, well, you've just mentioned the, the discussion group. Um, a lot of the, we will talk about methods and approaches a bit later, um, but a lot of the methods that, that we learn about, that we use, etc. Uh, one of the differences between that and, and dogma is that dogma seems to have been something, like you mentioned the teachers in Russia and you said that some of them knew more about dogma than you did. And, Possibly you're being slightly tongue-in-cheek about that, but on the other hand, on the other hand, um, it's something that many people have constructed together, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. I mean, one of the again, one of the pleasures of the kind of process 
uh, of the dogma discussion and everything that followed the writing of the book, etc., was that the way it synthesized uh, lots of different educational uh, strands, uh, many going back uh, a century to people like um, John Dewey, for example, the idea of experiential learning, or Paulo Freire in uh, Brazil and the idea of dialogic pedagogy. So in a sense, you know, one of the things that was very clear was that dogma didn't create anything new. What it did was it labeled what was already, in a sense, existing in a lot of teachers' practice. And a lot of teachers have said, oh, dogma, I've been doing that all my, you know, there's nothing new about that. So I, well, yes, exactly. This is what experienced teachers learn to do. They learn to move away from the constraints of the course book, of the syllabus, of the exams. I mean, they're always there, but they learn to create some space within that, these constraints to engage the learners by grounding their lessons in the experiences, feelings, you know, fears, hopes, aspirations of the learners and centering. So there's nothing, so this is what we were doing. It was kind of a natural process that most teachers go through. It's just what we did was we put a kind of name on it. And by putting a name on it, you sort of authenticate it. And so right. a lot of people say to me, say, oh, that's so good that you did this because I mean, I, I used to do this and I felt ashamed or I was terrified my director of studies, blah, blah, blah. No, no. And it's interesting that you should say, mention the Delta, Alistair, because mm. it was the Delta, uh, particularly the experimental practice element component or whatever it was of the Delta course, which um, in the old days when I was a Delta trainer, it was people would do silent way or TPR or something like that. And now a vast amount of them do so-called dogma lessons. And I, one of the great gratifying things about going around the world at conferences when I used to go around the world uh, was that people would come up to me and say, ah, yes, I, <laughs> I taught a dogma lesson on my uh, Delta course. And I was a bit skeptical at first, but oh, it was fantastic. The students loved it and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, well, good, good, I'm pleased. <laughs> yes, good. Well, look, um, I'm gonna say this now. I should have actually said it earlier on. To everybody, there's like nearly 200 people out there. Please feel free. As you know, the, the idea of we're all in this together is that everybody gets to ask Scott questions, um, not, just, not just myself. So feel, feel free, anything um, that occurs to you, please, please do. So it's, um, Dogma is still, I would say, uh, still in a way kind of controversial. I mean, you just mentioned, the, you know, the possibility of someone's director of studies, someone's coordinator saying, hang on a minute, I want you to do things this way rather than, rather than doing things this way. I mean, I don't want to get into dodgy territory, but there's, 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 a, there's a feeling that the idea of Dogma is it's like, it's anti-technology and it's anti-course book. What, what, what would you say about that? Well, I mean, it, as I said before, it, it sort of was in its original inception. It was, it was kind of anti because I, I saw course books and grammar syllabuses and everything that course books stood for as standing in the way of what I felt was the real communicative approach. Because if you go back in history, the communicative approach did emerge out of a belief that you learn a language by using it not you learn a language in order to use it but you learn a language through using it so there was that experiential element to it and those original architects of the communicative approach like dick Allwright and chris brumford etc uh they were all that was that was it you know you start off with communication you start off with a production task you start off with a student saying something or writing something and then you give them feedback on that and they do it again and so on and so on and so on so this was the kind of task based circle if you like cycle uh, and i saw that as being the course book stood in the way of that because they didn't start off with let's talk about something that you want to talk about they said today i'm going to teach you the present perfect continuous because you don't know it and i do uh, and this by <laughs> this way i can assert my authority on you and then we can test you on it and you're guaranteed to make mistakes in it. And therefore, again, again, so it goes on. So, I mean, this is a very, I mean, I'm exaggerating and I don't, I'm saying 99% of teachers don't teach like that. But uh, it seems that it was very difficult to find a space to do this real communication when you have this kind of grammar ad agenda sort of on top of you. You know, oh my God, it's Tuesday. I have to teach the present perfect continuous. Otherwise, I'll get the sack. So, um, 
So that was all. Uh, so it got was controversial because of that, because it, it dared to challenge the existing hegemony, not just of the course book, but the whole system. Uh, and it still does in some ways, because I mean, the system hasn't gone away. If anything, uh, the, the grammar syllabus has reasserted itself with a vengeance. And, um, uh, and so I still see the still, still see a place for a dogma approach. But of course, I, I'm a realist too. And I know that in 99% of people's teaching situations, you cannot throw out the course book. You cannot ignore the exams. You cannot uh, create your own syllabus. But so, but you know, we're teachers. We've been very good at this. We adapt. We change little things. When the door is closed, nobody can see us or hear us. And we do little things. And these are the famous dogma moments. And when you talk to teachers and say, you know, what was the best lesson you ever taught? And they'll often say, they won't say, ah, it was when I taught unit 12 of English file. And so they never say that. They'll say, ah, it was one lesson when there was a power cut mm. and we just had to kind of like, improvise and i think jj was talking about something similar last week uh but i i was i was tr I, my first teaching years overseas were in egypt and we had power cuts virtually every night and so you learned to improvise you couldn't rely on turning on the cassette listen listen to this uh the least you know and so on so we had conversations in the dark um and once you've done that once and you realize oh this is amazing even beginner students can with a bit of help you can get a conversation going uh and until yeah. you've experienced that of course you you are less liable to take those kinds of risks which i think of it that's the other thing about dogma actually i mean you mentioned the delta course alistair but i think for many teachers who said well i can't do this in my daily life but when i do do it as an experiment i learn an awful lot about myself and my students so it's a kind of professional development activity, which I would recommend. Uh, so one, you know, just once in a while, just, t t you know, do a lesson without the course book, see what it feels like. Do a lesson where you say to the students, what do you want to talk about today? Get into groups and do it. Uh, and I'll give well, you some feedback and so on. So, you we've know, got a, so yeah, we've got a, a good question um, along, along those lines from, um, from Lance Mills. And he's asked, uh, he said, hi, Scott. How do you think the dogmate approach works alongside a flipped classroom? So this way the students can cross off all the tenses, etc., while having a dynamic lesson in person. Yes, no, I mean, I was actually gonna mention the flipped classroom uh, later. I was on my list of things, uh, if we start talking about how to engage people online. But the idea that they do the spade work before the lesson, the endlessly boring exercises on the present perfect continuous, do that before the lesson, do it, you know, use English grammar and use, fabulous book for self-study. Uh, but then use the classroom for what classrooms are best at, which is putting people in touch with each other and real communication. What's the point of traveling all the way across town if you're gonna sit in a room doing exercises from Murphy? That's a great I mean, quote. <laughs> it sounds like a, that sounds like a T-shirt slogan, actually, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think? Because uh, at the moment, I mean, we're we're in a situation. Um, I, I'm not I'm not sure to my shame exactly how things are in Barcelona, but here in Argentina, we've been under lockdown since the 20th of March, I think it is. I think there's plenty of people I know from Uruguay in the room, and as I understand it, they're actually you know, on a staggered basis going back to school tomorrow, uh, like in person, but here we're gonna be in lockdown at least until the, the 16th of August, I think it is. Um, imagine a situation where therefore we've got a teacher who's going into class tomorrow on Zoom, okay? So going into class with the little bunny ears, but they're, they're going into class on Zoom. They've got like 45 students in the classroom. Do you think that that would be difficult for them to like have a have a dogma style class under those circumstances? Because it's a big class and it's online. What do you think? Well, I mean, it will be difficult for them if they haven't already experienced it in the real classroom. So the challenge is if you've experienced this in the real class, even if it's only once or twice, how do you transfer those kinds of interactions uh, 
uh, into an online classroom. Uh, and it, it seems to me that actually you do it quite easily because, you know, what if you, the history of dogma was to bring language learning back to the people in the room. Now, and when we conceived that, it was the people in the physical room, but there's no reason why it can't be the people in the Zoom room and, and it's various breakout rooms. So the same kind of conversations can happen online as they can happen uh, in the classroom. Uh, and the flip stop side of it could be, you know, the grammar work, et cetera, doing that again, as I said, doing it before the, the lesson or after the lesson or whatever. Coming back to Lance's question, maybe, yeah, ticking things off that you've actually covered that came up. That's a good idea. But uh, if you can create communicative interaction in the classroom. Now, sometimes you have to contrive this, even in real classrooms. That was the whole point of writing this book. It was like, you know, there are how many, there's hundreds of activities in this book because teachers need activities. They need recipes. They need plans. They need templates for lessons. And a lot, especially new teachers, but a lot of templates for lessons are inherently dogmatic because they provide opportunities for learners to be creative with language and be meaningful. So I'm thinking of things like some very basic uh, games, guessing games where, you know, and it's great where you can do this online, uh, especially uh, if you can show on your phone something, some features of your environment, because you can say, okay, we're going to take turns. We're going to guess exactly where each person is. And we're going to show them a quick clip of the, room that they're in and then people can ask ask questions about it that kind of thing uh or where the teacher or the dictagloss activity where the teacher says i'm going to dictate a tiny little text yeah uh while i while i dictate it don't don't write just listen uh it's about 100 words long so you can't remember it but you'll remember the images it creates uh and when i've finished you're going to go into breakout rooms and see if you can reconstruct the text from memory uh and and so on so those are those are basic dogma techniques which require zero materials uh, mm. and then can maybe the text which is about the teacher can then generate students writing similar texts about uh themselves mm. so it's not that it's just sitting around having conversations until you're blue in the face no that doesn't work in classrooms and it doesn't work online necessarily um but interaction is capable online and where there's interaction there is dogma and you can put that on your t-shirt <laughs> put that on your t-shirt i like it okay um do you think that i'm gonna ask one more one more question about dogma i think um having said that we weren't really going to talk about that that much we have done but um what if there's a situation for example this is slightly playing devil's advocate um where you've got students who who some students in the class who be online or face to face who don't really want to talk for example i'm thinking of i don't know adult students who've come back and it's half seven in the evening and they're they're tired and and they don't really want to have a conversation does does the conversation have to be a part of it no it doesn't i mean i think one of the mistakes we made was making conversation part of the kind of three pillars and what, what really should be said dogma is driven by not conversations but by texts now texts wow. meaning both written and spoken so that you know you can there's no reason why you can't have the conversation as a, a written thing and of course on that ch chat room that's exactly what it is it's not a conversation as such it's written chat. I mean, it's happening in real time. It's like conversation, but it is written. And there's just that little bit of time so you can correct yourself or look things up. Um, but you can institute con con uh, conversations. And again, one of these, these kind of template activities we were talking about, show and tell, for example. I mean, who hasn't done show and tell? I remember at primary school in New Zealand, every lesson began with show and tell. And you knew when it was your turn and you came in and you showed something. This is my pet yeah photo his name is blah 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 and you know you prepared for it i did this recently i went back to sp spanish uh learning i went back to school in spain to brush up my spanish and the teacher gave us exactly the same thing we had to talk about a city a city that meant something to us and we had to do a little powerpoint presentation and be prepared to answer questions from the students and i talked about my hometown in new zealand so i spent all night till three in the morning looking up words like boiling mud geyser volcano <laughs> etc and uh and then i presented it It was fantastic achievement i felt so 
good on top of mm-hmm. it. And the questions that students were interested, so that was conversation in a sense, what it was talk or student generated text, but it was mm-hmm. formalized. Another, a colleague of mine, Neil Forrest, who I did all my teacher training with my Delta courses with in Barcelona, uh, he has this thing of every lesson starts where the students go into groups and they talk about something they've read or seen or heard mm-hmm. in well, the time between the lesson. Mm-hmm. They talk about it in groups, and then he goes around, he's listening, and he says, oh, that's an interesting story. I remember that one. And then when, once it's done, he'll say, okay, Monse, tell us your story about how you got robbed on the subway. And um, off we go. Now, the students mm-hmm. know. They don't told the night before, don't forget. They know that because it happens every lesson. It's the beginning of every lesson. It's part of the routine. We're going to go into groups. We're going to talk. So the student who hasn't prepared is going to feel mm-hmm. left out. But they'll still get the benefit of hearing the other people's conversations and contribute mm. to that. So, so it's, you know, and you can do that online. You can do that online mm. in a Zoom room. There's nothing to stop you doing the same thing. You start the lesson by chatting. Now, every teacher starts the lesson by chatting since time immemorial, but they didn't realize that that was the lesson. They thought this was the pre-lesson, but no. Dogma says, no, the chat is the lesson. And the best lessons are the ones that were generated by the chat. Great. Am I shouting? Am I shouting? Can you no, me? no, you are. But I love, I love the passion. That's that's at least three T-shirt slogans we've got in the last ten minutes. I like it. <laughs> um, so, which I've got a question from Jeremy here. Um, which method did you find worked when you were learning Spanish? Ah, well, oh, don't start me. I mean, what didn't work was the course book. Uh, we had a course book. Uh, it was a very well written course book. In fact, I know one of the writers. Uh, it was beautifully produced. But uh, I was doing an intensive course, two weeks, 20 hours a week. Uh, we spent the first week on the, on the unit on the course book whose topic was television. Television? I mean, who watches television, for heaven's sake? Certainly not me. I did nothing to say, <laughs> to say about it. And the other thing is, the grammar in that unit, can you believe it, was, guess what, all you Spanish speakers and Spanish teachers out there, what is it going to be? If it's B2 level in a course book, it's going to be the subjunctive. The subjunctive. I mean, I, I can't do the, I still get confused between the preterito and the imperfecto in the indicative. I mean, the subjunctive, that's, what I call icing on the cake. But every time I've gone to a language cl- lesson in Spanish, it's always been about the subjunctive. It's like, the sub- there's no other grammar in Spanish except the subjunctive? You must be kidding me. But when we got onto the unit on cities, which was the second week, that's when this teacher had the inspiration, we're gonna do these presentations. The other thing about, uh, but the other thing about those lessons was what I loved, and this is out of respect, that the teachers were fantastic at letting us talk and then giving feedback on it. So, and the students were fantastic because we we're all kind of adults and we didn't want to talk about television. So we found any excuse to talk about, you know, so one of the students had been down to the, the, that silly festival in Spain where they throw tomatoes at each other. So when she came back, talk about the tomato festival. Of course, that's what we talked about. We talked about, we talked about. And then the teacher gave us feedback and the teachers were fantastic. In fact, one of them was from Argentina. Uh, and they were, these women were fantastic. They'd been teaching for 40 years. They knew everything about Spanish gr- grammar, including the subjunctive. So they're able to say, stop, stop everybody. You're still having trouble with ser and estar. I mean, can you believe it? This is B2. And this is, we weren't, the subjunctive was like the least of our worries. We were still having trouble saying, estoy casado or soy casado. I mean, and so she would say, stop everybody. We're going to have to review this. <laughs> estoy muerto or soy muerto I mean uh, so it was it, for me those lessons were a vindication of everything I'd been saying about dogma that the course book was rubbish got in the way but the teachers were fantastic because they knew their grammar and they were able to generate conversations and give feedback mm. that's all you needed that's what I wanted I wanted correction I needed to be correct my Spanish was terrible because my friends never correct me that they wouldn't be my friends if they corrected me but teachers are allowed to correct. That's why you pay good money. I'm paying you, paying you to correct me. Please. <laughs> no, Write it down. Sorry, you've, you've given me the giggles, Scott. Um, okay, so look, get, 
Yeah, no, I do. Jeremy's asked me, do I relate, Alice? So yes, I, 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 I totally relate, I, I must say. And uh, the, the, the grammar that I started learning, because when I started learning Spanish, when I came out here, the, the other thing is that many of the things that I was being taught was like, were phrases like, um, I don't know, uh, phoning a hotel and saying, quisiera hablar con el señor bla, and then, you know, I got out here to Buenos Aires and suddenly people were using the most incredibly colorful language. And I thought, hang on a minute, like you're saying, Scott, this is what I want to do. These are the kind of conversations I want to have. And this is the kind of, you know, I'm going to call it real language that I want to learn. Well, look, um, dogme, this is bringing it to methods for a second. Um, dogme, would you say, I don't want to dwell on this for a particularly long time, but if you had to say if it was method or approach or something else, what would you say? Oh, well, I mean, yeah, I've been dealing with that question for so long and I keep saying it wasn't a method. It was an idea. It was an analogy. It was a metaphor. That was all. It was a suggestion. It just became, and then we said, oh, this is Scott Thornby's method. Oh, this is Scott Thornby's one big idea. No, I've had two big ideas. It's one of them, but I have another big idea. Uh, <laughs> but, but then I eventually gave up and said, okay, let's call it a method. Then what, what attributes of a method does it uh, meet and that a method has to have a theory of learning and a theory of language. And there is a theory of learning in uh, dogma, which is the same theory of learning as in task based learning from which in a sense it's derived. And there's a theory of language, which came after really, I think, which is more to do with emergent language constructions, etc. It's not just about grammar. It's about vocabulary, lexical, all those kind of things thrown into the bag. So when I wrote, ah, now here, here the publicity spot, sorry, um, but when I wrote, wrote this book, uh, which is called 30 Language Teaching Methods, of course I included it um, because, you know, why not? And, uh, but I do make the point that it didn't start life as me sitting there saying, I'm going to design, I'm going to design a method uh, and it's going to make me rich. No, uh, it was not, it didn't happen like that at all, but it does have some of the attributes of a method, certain techniques and procedures, etc. A philosophy, if you like. Well, look, speaking of which, because I wanted to talk about methods and I want to talk about your new book in a second, that we have landed people on the moon and we're able to print 3D body parts now. Why mm -hmm. is it that we can't find a definitive method for learning another language, do you think? Or can we? Yes, Dr. there Dr. is one. Oh. There is one, uh, and it's not dogma. Uh, if you took an ad, and we're talking about adults here, because children uh, up to a certain age will learn the language anyway, whatever you do, whatever method. Uh, but if they get enough exposure, and I suppose that's the point I'm making with an adult like me, for me to have learned Spanish age 36 or whatever, when I came to Spain, I would need to have been airdropped into a Spanish village where nobody spoke English. Yeah. That is to say, I would need to have experienced total immersion. And anybody who experiences total immersion learns the language, even as an adult. Mm -hmm. So that's the method that works. But of course, you know, we can't replicate that three hours a week in a classroom. No. We can replicate some of the experience of that immersion in the classroom though, by not banging on about the bloody present perfect continuous all the time, but doing immersive kind of communicative experiences and tasks, etc., and then doing stuff outside the classroom and training the learners to take advantage of the affordances that exist outside the classroom, particularly on the internet, to listen, watch, read, etc., be to get have that immersive experience. Now, I'm not saying that grammar doesn't enter into this. I mean, of course it does, but the grammar in a sense is late acquired. It comes afterwards, after the experience of communicating. And then you sit down and say, now, how could I do this better? Ah, I know, I need to learn the subjunctive, for heaven's sake, maybe. Uh, <laughs> if I want to be accepted in this village that I've been airdropped into. Um, I'm trying but, to imagine a village, sorry. I'm trying to imagine a village where... They won't accept you if you don't know the subjunctive. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, so coming back to your question, though, to be serious, yeah, there's been lots of different methods because there's lots of different contexts in which languages are taught, lots of different kinds of learners, lots of different theories of learning, lots of different theories of language, it's true. Uh, but also in the end, you'll never be able, unless they have this immersive experience, you'll never be able to teach anybody a second language because it's like, it's like trying to train a 50 year old to run a marathon. You're not equipped for it physically, yeah. mentally, you know, it's too late. It's a terrible thing to have to say to the learners when they come into your class, but it's too late. Yeah. But you'll never be able to run a marathon, but you'll be able to walk 10 miles. I mean, you know, yeah. I, I, as a language teacher, I can give you the means whereby you will never be mistaken for a, a native speaker, but you will be communicatively, communicatively efficient in the kind of context which you need to be. And that, again, is the principle of the dogma approach. You teach what students need and what they want, uh, and you engage with them, and so that they become part of the process of negotiating the syllabus, mm. so that they get what they want, and they're not taught the subjunctive. And if I'd said to my Spanish teachers, like, I'll do any course in the curriculum here, but do not teach me the subjunctive, because it's not of any interest or use to me. Well... I'm going to play slightly devil's advocate now about um, methods because and you've you've got the book that you've that you've shown us. Um, is it is it really important as a new teacher? Is it really important that I learn about grammar translation, audio lingualism, etc.? I mean, haven't haven't we come too far to to need to look back? Well, I mean, it's a good question. And I think I, I, would, I would have agreed with you a few years ago. And I think there's enough books out there about methods already. We, we don't need another one. Uh, there's some very good ones. And I consulted them and I, I acknowledged them. But I think actually I, two things. One is that as, a, as in any profession, it's important to know, to be a professional, it's important to know the history of the profession, to dig down the archaeology of English language teaching. I think it's just interesting and it's worth knowing not least because of how much goes around and around. You know, we think, oh, the natural approach, 1970s, uh, uh, what's his name? Tracy Terrell, Steve Ka Crash, Steve Doctor Crash, and yes, mm. but there was a natural approach in 1890. Hello, Dr. Crash, and, you know, it's mm. not new. Dr. Crash would agree. He'd say, yeah, I just labeled it like, mm. um, but uh, so it's worth knowing that, you know, what goes around comes around for a start. There's nothing new under the sun. And the other thing is, I think for new teachers particularly, they do need models. They do need a template into which to squeeze some kind of lesson plan. And methods offer that. They say this is, so what, one of the things about the book, I look at 30 methods and each chapter is divided. The background, does it work? Oh no, how does it work? Does it work? And then what's in it for us? What's in it for us now as practicing teachers? What could we retrieve from this method? And there's something always to be retrieved from any method. For, for somewhere, for someone, it probably worked. So it's worth looking at that and say, this is like, this method is pretty. Grammar translation, don't knock it. I mean, millions of people have learned languages over countless centuries through grammar translation i mean it serves them very well i think it needs an update uh or an upgrade uh and that could easily be done to map onto it some features of the communicative approach but that's not uh, rocket science but grammar translation you know what's wrong with translation hello you can quote me okay it's a it's a fourth or a fifth t-shirt slogan at the moment there's um speaking of methods there's there's quite a lot of, there's one in particular that I keep seeing, I don't know if the rest of you out there have seen it, on YouTube at the moment. Um, there's, this advert always flashes up with this individual promising to be able to learn a language in three months because they were able to learn another language very quickly as well. See, I'm being very standoffish about who this is, but um, it's like promising you can learn this language in three months um, with this technique. Why do, why do things like that, um, in fact, Jeremy's asked this question, what do you think about the ads online that claim to have a miracle course um, and the key to learning the language as an adult? Um, yeah, I mean, I think yeah. this is a very interesting phenomenon actually, and it's definitely, it's kind of an internet phenomenon, although there have been people around for many years. There was a guy called 
Michel Thomas, for example, in the 1980s, 90s, who taught people like Emma, the actress. Um, uh, Watson? No. No. Thompson. Thompson, exactly. Thompson, and, lots, yeah. and Woody Allen and very other people who, who rave about his technique. But he was an un... He, had, he was teaching how he had learned... He was a polyglot. He had learned hundreds of languages. Now, that, that is now much more common on the internet. In fact, actually, in this book, I devote a chapter to what I call online polyglots. Because I think, you know, these people are... Not all of them are fraudsters or, you know, snake oil salesmen. Uh, they actually mm. are worth listening to, I think, some of them. Uh, and they are phenomenal if you take, even on their own evidence, uh, they, not just the number of languages they've learned as adults, but the degree of proficiency they claim to have in them. Uh, and it's quite impressive and enviable. And I think it's worth, and people are now, even in the literature you get in, in uh, uh, academic magazines, people are looking, journals are looking at these people now and saying, actually, this is interesting. We may be gifted learners. We need to look at and see what it is that they have and that we could possibly learn from and import into our own learning as learners or our teaching as teachers. So I don't think they should be dismissed entirely. One of the problems, though, is when they kind of, they, they dine out on their own success, but they don't investigate right. <laughs> from an academic point of view. And very few of them reference any of the literature on attitude, aptitude, uh, comprehensible input, fluency, they don't know anything about it. And I think, well, that's, you know, it wouldn't cost you a lot to read a basic book on second language acquisition and then map your own experience into this kind of vocabulary. And that would give them a lot more authority than they have at the moment. Mm. Right, well, methods aside for a second, uh, what do you think would be the most useful way of teaching and, and engaging students at the moment in our, in our, in our coronavirus situation? Um, well, I mean, I was asked this recently on a, on a webinar thing. Somebody said, uh, how would you uh, engage 30 12 year olds on Zoom? And I said, <laughs> if I had the answer to that question, I'd be a millionaire. I mean, you can't actually, I'm sorry. You just have to wait to the day that we go back to real classrooms. We'll I'll come back to that point in a minute. You can engage people more than perhaps uh, and I think we've already answered in some ways uh, uh, the question a bit by we say flipping the classroom, doing some of the kind of boring stuff before or after. Don't do, use the classroom to do boring Murphy kind of ex exercises. And there's no fun in that. There's nothing engaging about that unless you maybe turn it into a competition. Um, but even then, uh, that's a kind of shallow kind of engagement seems to me. I think you can engage people by doing things where they actually are being creative and communicative. I mean, I've been working, here's another bit of background. I've been working for five years now, I think, with Nick Bilber of the Hands Up Project. Where Now, Nick is an inspired educator who I first got to know because I, I was editing some books he wrote for the Cambridge Handbook series. Uh, and he's an ex, he's an uh, experienced actor and storyteller. And uh, he started this project working with kids, classrooms in Gaza, in G occupied Gaza, kids who have no access to uh, native speakers of English or any speakers of English apart from their teacher. And using very simple technology, he's been doing this online since before COVID by 10 years practically, using simple technology doing stuff with these kids in these classrooms in Gaza, drama activities, storytelling, communicative games. So there's Nick in his kitchen in Torquay in Southern England. And he's doing a game with these kids. And the teacher, the classroom teacher is there in the classroom in Gaza. And these teachers are, and these kids are playing this game with them or they're doing plays. Now, of course, these are in classrooms. It's complicated further now because the children are not in classrooms any longer. They're in their homes with poor internet access, but it's still going on. And Nick's been running a very successful Saturday morning sessions with kids 
games, communicative activities, storytelling with volunteers, volunteers, uh, hands up project, write it down. I mean, it's the most wonderful thing. It's been engaging kids online for the last five, 10 years. And, you know, through drama, storytelling, games. So it's not important, and big groups of kids too. So thank you, Vicky. Um, <laughs> and the project. Do you, and, um, do you think students should, so the students should learn through games as well? That's, that's it's perfectly, a, yeah. I mean, you know, kids, games, songs, theater. I mean, there's nothing else that they need to learn a language. That's another t-shirt slogan right there. That's another t-shirt slogan right there. Put it here first. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk about, for, for a minute, you mentioned storytelling a couple of times. Um, and it seems to me that in terms of engagement, I remember once actually, I remember watching a, a talk and somebody, I can't remember who it was, unfortunately, but someone had come up with a, a, a criticism, I'm going to call it, or a point about dogme saying something like, um, but what if the, like I mentioned to you earlier on, what, you know, what if there's people in the classroom who don't want to talk? And I remember I sent a tweet at the time, it was a while ago now, to, to, to Luke Meddings about it. And he said, if you find, find the, the, the human being in the classroom, you will find someone who, who wants to converse, who wants to tell a story, it was, that he said. So, because you've mentioned storytelling now, um, so you, you think that's a, a, a really good way of engaging the students? Yes, I mean, uh, tell your story first. It doesn't have to be like, you know, war and peace. It doesn't have to be he Ernest Hemingway. It's just something that happened to you the other day on the subway. Um, tell it, have them ask questions, have them guess the ending uh, or, the, or the outcome. Uh, then have them uh, go into the breakout room, retell it, write it down. Uh, they can stop and send me questions if they get lost. Um, then uh, they hear it again, maybe, uh, but a different version of it. So you're going to hear the same story again, but I've changed three key pieces of information. Anything mm -hmm. like I'm, I'm inventing, you know, but I mean, this is, and then they do the same on each other. I'm going to tell you a story, then I'm going to tell it to you again, but there's mm -hmm. going to be three things I've changed in it. You have to listen. So it gives the listener something to listen for. Yeah. You're, now you're they can sound... do that to the whole class or they can go into pairs in the breakout room and do it to each other. But I mean, it's not rocket science. Again, there's no materials. They don't have to read anything. And you say, oh, where's the grammar coming from? Well, the grammar is coming from, I mean, it's a well-known fact. Where's the book? I have a new book here somewhere. <laughs> task, uh, task repetition. Mm -hmm. I was banging on about it at a webinar recently. Some of you might have been at. But when you repeat a task, it's better, always. When you repeat a task in a second language, it's always better. It's more fluent. It's more accurate and the language gets more complex. And this has been proven again and again in the research. Repeat the task, repeat the task. Now, if you want to guarantee that it gets better, give feedback. Remember my story about my city, telling my story about my hometown in Spanish? It was a fantastic experience. The students were engaged. But what I didn't do and what this teacher didn't give me the permission to do was to do it again. And I was desperate to do it again. I said, okay, you give me the feedback. I want to do it again. I want to do it again. I want to show that I can do it a little bit better this time, taking into account the feedback. That's where the input comes in. It's not because today we're going to do the present perfect continuous and you've got to tell a story using the present perfect continuous three times. No, let's not engage. We're, we're getting the definite feeling that you're not a fan of the subjunctive in Spanish nor the present perfect <laughs> continuous. That's abundantly clear from this interview. Listen, um, Katya has just uh, made a point in the in the chat box that um, it's, I'm going to literally quote what uh, she's written here, but you can't do it every day. They lose interest after some time. Discuss. Yeah, I mean, students lose interest in everything. I mean, uh, and this is one of the points of writing the book the Teaching Unplugged book was to provide a range of activities which was nevertheless consistent with those three basic principles. So you could do different kinds of activities and it doesn't need to be speaking, it always it could be writing and it doesn't need to be in pairs or groups, it could be individual and you know, and the, I you mean there's not, all sorts of possible permutations of some of these basic techniques I think that could provide variety. And, you know, when push comes to shove, you know, 
it wouldn't kill them if you taught the present perfect continuous for one lesson. <gasps> Nobody's going to die. <laughs> no, no one's going to die. Quite, yeah, quite, quite. So, um, one of the things, going back to the to teaching unplugged for a second, in that case, um, one of the things that you were just saying. So, in terms of our three three pillars, as it were, we've we've got our um, materials light emergent language and maybe conversation driven but like you were saying perhaps that should be um, I'm not text driven but what were you saying about texts and that that particular pillar yes I mean I instead of just change the word conversation for text but me mm. text meaning both spoken and written yeah right so there's you no reason why first, people guys. say oh you can't learn to write using dogma but of course if it's conversation driven no yeah no. That was our mistake. Naughty. Right. Uh, we should have said text from the start. So students can write their own text. I had this fabulous activity that my a colleague of mine taught me, the paper conversations. I think it's in here somewhere. The students, again, it's the, it's the formalizing the classroom chat, the, the, the chat at the beginning of the lesson. So instead of chatting with your partner about what you did in the weekend, write the chat mm. as if you were texting. Yeah, but mm. writing on a piece of paper, give the paper. Yeah, so what did you do in the weekend, Pedro? Pedro writes the answer. What did you do? Blah, blah, blah. Conversations, it's written down. It's written down, fantastic, because the teacher can take it, and there's data here the teacher, teacher can use for feedback. So that's writing, yeah? So it's not conversation as such, but it's, and there's language. It's text. You see, one of the basic principles, I mean, one of the techniques or methods, coming back to the methods that always interested me, was community language learning, not communicative, but community, mm. community or counseling language learning. Uh, one of these kind of fringe methodologies of the 1960s and 1970s, where students in groups having kind of encounters with each other in groups and constructing conversations, which they then record line by line. And then with the teacher's help, uh, there's the teachers mediating whenever the student needs to say something and they don't know how to say it, the teacher tells them, they practice it, it's recorded, etc. The conversation is built incrementally and then it's played back and then it's transcribed. This is the bit I like. So this conversation that's generated by the students, their conversation, thien por thien, is mm -hmm. then transcribed and the teacher points out features of it that seem to be probably within their current level of competence prepositions subjunctive mm. rest of a continuous whatever great well you you heard it here first everyone there's um, a new modification to the three pillars of dogma you heard it here first on we're all in this together um okay so i've got three questions that we we normally ask everyone to um kind of wrap things up and certainly not that i want to but if you had to finish this sentence scott my secret to motivating students is dot 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 what would you say well, you didn't ask me about this one before we no i know i didn't sorry <laughs> you've thrust this upon me well, i would say my secret of motivating students uh i don't want to get all kind of cheesy and say it's all about you know being a nice guy Mm. all that kind of thing because I don't think it necessarily is I mean obviously there's uh, you know, the interpersonal relationships you have with your students is very very important uh, but I wouldn't want to think it boiled down to that entirely mm. but, but I think it's uh, it's like in any educational context the secret of motivating them is giving them what they want mm. now you could say oh my students don't know what they want that's why we have a syllabus and a course form so, well actually um, did you ever ask them Maybe you could just put the question and they say, oh, I don't know why I want to learn English. Well, that's okay, fine. Well, I'll teach you the present perfect continuous. But if they do say, I want to travel, I want to work, I want to watch uh, streaming series on television, I want to understand pop songs, then okay, good. Now we have a motive. Once you've got a motive, you've got motivation. I like that. Once you've got a motive, you've got motivation. Well, think all these T-shirts, we're going to become millionaires with all these T-shirts, slogans. fantastic. Um, Scott, how do, you think, how do you think society will view teachers after coronavirus, after COVID-19? 
Well, I mean, I hope they review them as being uh, like they view the health workers as being people who have maintained civilization as we know it. And they wow. deserve to be put on a statue in Trafalgar Square or whatever, because these people have kept things going, even though they've done it under extraordinarily difficult situations. But then teachers have always been resilient. They've had to be. They've had to cope. They've had to be flexible. And they're underappreciated. But they learn to live with that. Uh, they're underpaid and they just about learn to live with that. But, uh, but what I do hope, well, my biggest fear out of all this is that institutions and ministries will use COVID as an excuse to close down real old fashioned classrooms and say, oh, we can do it online. Look how successful it's been. But this is my point. This is my answer to the teacher who said, how can I engage 30, 12 year olds online? You can't, darling, you can't. Mm -hmm. You can do it in the classroom, but you'll never be able to do it successfully online. That's what classrooms are good for. Don't let anybody close down the classrooms, the real classrooms. And they're trying to do this in universities, for example, all around the world. That's why I lost my job. Uh, don't let it happen to primary school children, particularly. We must have classrooms, real classrooms and real teachers in them. Wonderful. Okay, well, so, um, Marcella, I'm going to, I think I've lost her name in the chat box. I think it was Marcella Gajo has mentioned that she saw you in Mar del Plata in here oh. in Argentina. Um, it, and in fact, you and I were talking about this a minute ago, weren't we? Yes. Can I share my screen? Please. That's what I was going to ask. Please share your screen. Special is, surprise for you, Marcella. That's fantastic. This is uh, a photo of my first trip to, Ar to the Southern Cone uh, in 1995. You can tell by the trousers that I was a kind of fashion <laughs> victim even then. Uh, at Mar del Plata, exactly. My first trip to Argentina, I, my biggest audience, I'd never spoken with a microphone before. Uh, it was fantastic. I loved it. And you know why I particularly liked it? Because it was the first uh, Spanish speaking country I had visited having been living in Spain. So it was kind of like, oh my God, I can use Spanish all around the world. Oh, how fabulous. And it was such a wonderful Spanish too. So, um, so that was my first trip to the Southern Cone. I was in Montevideo more recently, in fact, um, only two years ago, I think. But the last time I was in Argentina was uh, in 2001. And it was for the 25th anniversary of International House Buenos Aires. Wow. Yes, I was there. We were there, weren't we, friends? Yeah. We were there. Great. So I'm going to finish with uh, one question for you. If you could give one piece of advice to teachers these days who are, are very, very tired with all this and everything, uh, what, what would it be? Well, I'm tempted to use the advice from Midsummer Night's Dream that uh, uh, the head, the player, director of the players said to the, the group after they'd been rehearsing and they'd finished the rehearsal and she said, well, he said, I can't remember, uh, take pains, be perfect, adieu. Uh, and I think, <laughs> you know, as teachers, we do take pains. And uh, one of the things that it sort of bothers me is when people say, oh, dogma, that's just about like, you know, not planning. That's just, you know, winging it. Uh, I say, no, actually not. It's very hard work doing a lesson where you're building on what the students are giving you. So you need to take pains and you need to be perfect. And we all achieve perfection in our own particular way, in our own particular contexts. Uh, so that's uh, <laughs> my Shakespearean advice to you all. Take pains. Great, great, Fan fantastic, love it. Well, it's it's past the hour now, so I'm very, very unfortunately, we're all going to have to say goodbye. I'm going to go on gallery view so that um, everyone can give you a little round of applause. Thank you very, very much for being with us today, Scott. It's been an absolute, absolute pleasure to, to have you here. I'm going to say thank you again to International House uh, Montevideo for uh, sponsoring and providing the platform for us. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you again, Scott Thornbury. It's, um, I've been a fan of your work since I started teacher training, so it's um, a real pleasure and a privilege to, to have you here today. So thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you, Alistair. Bye-bye, everybody. All right. Bye, everyone. See you next time. Bye.